Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Church of the Nativity. Our service begins today on page 351 of the Book of Common Prayer with the Penitential Order. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. I'm going to invite the younger members of the congregation to come up here with me for a quick story time before we head out for our Christian formation time. So come on up with me, guys. And age is relative here, so (laughs) you decide if you belong in this group or not. All right. Ooh, we got a big crowd today. Hey, sweetie, I'm so happy to see you. Look at this. Oh, look at all these friends. Hi, guys. Welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. Okay. I'm happy to see you, friend. (laughs) All right. So we, come on, my friend Lennox. Here he comes. Here he comes. Yay. Today, we are going to hear more of a story about Jesus and a really special friend, one of his best friends, and actually three friends, two sisters and a brother. Huh? Yes, like some of you have sisters and brothers. We're going to go to the place. Your sister is here. Yes, we're going to go next door. To the education room, where there we've got the comic books that we'll hear the story again. And this is a story about how Jesus hears that one of his friends is really sick. But he says, well, we'll get there in time. And what usually happens when Jesus meets sick people? He usually makes them better, right? You remember those stories? He does, yes, yes. 
Well, this time, Jesus doesn't get there. His friend dies. Oh, my gosh. Oh, this is a sad story. We don't come to church to hear sad stories, do we? No. No, but sometimes stories are sad. Sometimes, have you ever been sad? Uh -huh. Have you ever had yeah, moments when you're sad? Only when you just feel really sad and alone? Keep hurting the other side. Oh my goodness, we're going to wrap you up in bubble wrap. <laughs> and sometimes when we get hurt, we're sad, right? Yes, so we are going to go and hear the rest of the story of what happens after Jesus is sad. Okay? So. <laughs> Let's go hear it next door, Lucy. Okay, we're going to hear the rest of the story about Jesus' friend and how sad Jesus was and what Jesus does about it, okay? Do you want to come with us? You can come with us if you want to. Any grown-ups are welcome to come with us, too. Brock, don't forget your book. You're going to need your book, bud. All right. Why don't you come with me? We'll go find Mom and Dad. There we go. There's a bud. And they're going to come back at communion. Want to go sit with mom? There you go. A reading from the book of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many living, lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the, these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and you will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Now, now a, certain a certain man, man was, was ill, Ill, Lazarus of Bethany, Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus, has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let, let us go, go to him. him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she, when she had, had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, 
Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Now I have a confession to make to all of you. When the season of Lent began to glimmer on the horizon of the church calendar, in my heart, I knew I was not up for it. In seasons past, I often practiced an act of self-discipline, mostly self-denial, that ranged from 40 days without caffeine heaven help me, <laughs> to an attempt at solidarity with my Muslim friends by keeping a full daylight fast for Lent as they do during their holy month of Ramadan, an attempt that I gave up in the throes of uncertainty surrounding health and well-being in March of 2020. In short, I could not fathom embracing self-denial for 40 days. And this I attribute in no small part to the truth that for the past three years, all of us have been called to self-denial as a reaction to the realities of a global pandemic that even today still requires self-denial for the sake of safety. Now we joked back in 2020 that the Lent during which COVID began disrupting our lives was the Lentiest Lent we ever Lented. And I think that has remained true for the entirety of the past three years. Just this past December, COVID robbed my family, again, of celebrating Christmas together. Seven members of my family contracted COVID from separate sources. And Ashley and I, though not sick, stayed home. We didn't gather here with you on Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day found us celebrating Christmas with my family through a computer screen, as we had done in 2020. So giving up something for Lent was not in the cards for me this year. But while I was willing to give myself grace around these feelings about Lent and self-denial, I was unwilling to give up Lent entirely. But what would a Lent unrooted in my pre-pandemic traditions of self-denial actually look like? I gave it a lot of thought, and when my mom asked me, what are you giving up for Lent, I said, giving up things for Lent. <laughs> and I decided that during this season instead, I would work to seek out Jesus as he would have appeared in the world. A Jesus walking through this world, incarnate in human form, and more than that, fully human. Fully divine, yes, that too. But a Jesus who was fully human. And it led me to a lot of thinking. Now first, some theological background. And as I finish, after I finish sharing these thoughts with you today, we're gonna rise together and affirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. In the bold statements that we make each week, we actually affirm both Jesus' divinity and his humanity. We affirm that he is of the same substance of God, of one being with the Father, 
and yet that he came down from heaven and was made man. And affirming both is actually vitally important. In the first centuries of the church, competing Christologies argued about the nature of Jesus. An early Jewish Christian sect called the Ebionites argued for an adoptionist position. They viewed Jesus as a mere mortal human, chosen or adopted by God to undertake a mission on earth. And while he was divinely chosen, the Ebionites would actually argue against the actual divinity of Jesus. To them, Jesus was just a person, a very special person, but a mere human. And on the flip side, Docetics argued just the opposite. To them, Jesus was a being by nature, pure in spirit, and did not possess an actual human form. They would, act, they would argue that Jesus only appeared to walk on the earth as a human person, in the semblance of a human being, but without human substance. And the proto-Orthodox faction, those who would come to later craft the early versions of the creed we recite each Sunday, instead argued for a holy mystery, one that embraced a dual nature within Christ. For them, we needed to affirm Jesus Christ as both. Now it's hard, and we may not fully understand the real possibility of a dual nature, hence the holy mystery, but Jesus walked this earth both fully human and fully divine, of one being with the Father, but made man. But why does it matter? Because the gospel readings we've heard throughout this season and other stories in the Bible show us that Jesus, despite possessing a nature of one being with the Father, deeply committed to the human experience. Our first gospel lesson of the season found Jesus being tempted in the desert. And Stephanie reminded us that this story was not about us, it was about God, and it was. You see, I believe that the devil in the story wasn't tempting Jesus to seize earthly power or perform miracles, but rather he was tempting Jesus to abandon the human experience and be God. Humans are hungry, and Jesus was hungry. He had the power to change those stones into bread, but instead, he embraced the human experience. And as in that story, which one of us hasn't been tempted to test God? Who hasn't posited what we would do if we were in charge of the world? In that lesson, Jesus experiences both of those too. He was God doing human things. And then the gospel stories are rife with examples of Jesus being human first and then God. He doesn't scale up. He offers compassionate relief to the suffering people he encounters, doing all the good he can while continuing to embrace the human experience. Now one thing you may or may not know about me is that I suffer from deep pathological anxiety. My amygdala spits out stress hormones that it has absolutely zero business producing. And for me, it's a medical problem. And I have cognitive methods by which I'm able to keep it under control. But sometimes, despite everything I do, it gets the better of me. And when it does, panic sets in. Now this Monday, Thursday, we'll once again hear the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And friends, religious art that has come down to us over the centuries often paints this as a rather serene moment. You know, in some paintings, Jesus kneels on a stone, his hands are folded, he's looking up into the heavens, and a beam of light is illuminating his face. But the gospel lesson betrays that image. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus is in agony to the point of sweating blood. And while this may sound like hyperbole, 
It actually isn't. Hematohydrosis is a medical condition that produces bloody sweat, and it occurs in humans who are under intense anxiety or unmanageable levels of stress. Though also divine, Jesus had a human panic attack of the first order. And when I hear that story, it helps me to know that God understands what anxiety does to my body, though, though not to the level that Jesus suffered. <laughs> the divine embrace of the human experience builds empathy between humanity and God. And truth be told, friends, God understood all of this all along. But Jesus' human experience helps me relate to God in a less abstract way. And really, friends, which one of us hasn't wanted to flip over a table in the face of economic injustice? <laughs> Jesus did. And I think that's one of the reasons why this gospel lesson is so very powerful to me. Throughout my life, it has been and remains one of the sacred passages of the New Testament that I find often written on my heart. And the events of the last couple weeks actually draw me closer to Jesus through the words of this passage. Jesus goes to Bethany at the instigation of Mary and Martha to be with his sick friend, Lazarus. They sent word for him to come, but he arrives too late. Lazarus has died. The human experience of not making it to the bedside of a sick relative or friend before they draw their last breath is one that Jesus experienced too. And two weeks ago, I arrived too late. We had received word that my mom's sister, Sharon, was likely about to depart this world. It was sudden. She'd been sick for a long time, but this was rapid and unexpected. And while my mom and I set out immediately when we got word and we drove through the whole night, the seven-hour drive meant that we got there too late. She had gone on to join the communion of saints before we had arrived. And I know that God understands that pain because as a human being, Jesus lived it too. Now my interpretation might be easy to wave off because we know the end of that story. Jesus exercises divine power and commands Lazarus to rise again. But walk through the narrative. And I think you'll see that Jesus committed to the humanity of the situation first. Jesus delays going to visit Mary and Martha so that when he arrives, Lazarus has passed away. And Martha greets him in what I imagine to be the midst of the very angry part of grief. Her words are easy to read in the gospel as passive, meek, even pleading, but I hear a Martha who is incandescent with rage. And Jesus offers her a platitude. And after this exchange with Martha, Jesus encounters Mary, who kneels in front of him. But does she kneel because she recognizes the divine authority within him? Or is her grief just so debilitating that she can no longer stand. Confronted with the anguish Mary and Martha are bearing in their grief as they mourn the loss of their brother, Jesus embraces human grief. Now the old King James Version of the Bible encapsulates this in just two words that may have been the favorite Bible verse of every Baptist kid like me who had to memorize scripture. Jesus wept. Gold star. But I think that for anyone in the throes of grief, they might be among the most important words in the entire scriptures. Jesus felt the pain of this loss. We need never be alone again in our sorrow because Jesus showed us 
that God empathizes with our grief. The abstract has become reality. And it is only after fully committing to the human experience that Jesus demonstrates divine power and calls Lazarus out of the tomb. My friends, that power resided within him the entire time. He could have walked into town with his disciples, told Mary and Martha, girls, I've got this, and gone straight to the tomb and called his friend back. But he was as committed to the human experience here as he had been in the desert in the temple facing off with the money changers, in his panic in the garden of Gethsemane, and ultimately in his intense suffering and death upon the cross before he once again displays the divine power in his own resurrection. And that is why affirming the dual nature of Christ in the Nicene Creed each week is so important to me. Were we to embrace the Ebionite idea of Jesus as merely an exceptionally devout man wielding power given to him by God as he adopts him as his chosen son in those moments following his baptism in the Jordan, then the idea of God understanding the human experience remains squarely in the abstract. And And if if we we embrace embrace the docetic notion of of Jesus Jesus as as a being being of pure pure spirit, spirit, one one fully fully divine, divine, then then the the human human experience experience that he appeared appeared to have was was merely merely an illusion. illusion. And again, again, we're we're left left with only only the abstract abstract notion notion that that God God understands understands us. us. But in in embracing embracing the dual nature, nature, we can can confidently confidently assert that God stands right right beside us us in the the human human experience experience because because we we have have the stories passed down to us of how Jesus though divine, lived fully human. So as we live out these last days of Lent together and begin to walk with Jesus on his journey toward Jerusalem and eventually to the agony of the cross, my prayer is that we never lose sight of the fact that through Jesus, God committed to the human condition so that we might more fully know God really does empathize with what we face in our lives, and he walks beside us the whole way. Amen. Amen. Page 358. I invite you to stand. stand. And let let us affirm our faith in the God who is fully human and entirely divine with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.
Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, give ear to our thanksgivings and petitions, as we say, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. As the church walks with Christ to the cross this Lenten season, send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us from the wilderness and towards service and renewal, that we may put all our trust in you. In the Anglican and diocesan cycles of prayer, we remember the Anglican Church of South America, Abundant Life, Greensboro, All Saints, Greensboro, and Church of the Holy Spirit, Greensboro. Lord of mercy, as our world suffers from the darkness of war, hunger, and disaster, may we seek peace, refuge, <clears throat> and safety for all. Like, like Nicodemus, Nicodemus, help us to find new life in the darkness and see the goodness of the world that you love so much. Lord of mercy, create in us clean hearts, O God, as we look for the living water to restore and revive the earth you have created. Like the Samaritan woman, may we share that living water through restoration of community and be witnesses of justice for the people of the city of Raleigh. Lord of mercy, as Christ restored sight to the blind man, he healed his body and his spirit, and he restored him to his family and his community. May all who suffer feel your healing presence, especially those we name now. Give them the joy of your saving help again. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. As Jesus wept with Mary and Martha in his grief over Lazarus, <clears throat> weep with those who mourn and give comfort to the dying. We pray for those who have died, especially Rosemary Bolas and Sharon Newell. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. In the glory of the cross, Christ embraced the power of death and broke its hold over your people. In this time of repentance, draw all people to yourself, that we who confess Jesus as Lord may put aside the deeds of death and accept the life of your kingdom. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Is your mic okay? Yes. Okay. It just did a weird thing. How about now? Okay. okay. Mine is on. Peace. Good morning. It is so great to see you all. So great to see you all here today. Uh, so uh, our Habitat Build Day yesterday, big success. Thank you so much to all who showed up. We will continue to help and support on other build days. Um, that just happened to be our specific day. Thank you, Charlie, Charlie for, for the, the delicious, delicious lunch, lunch I, understand I understand yesterday. It, it did, did rain, rain a little bit. bit. It, was it was warm, warm but it, it did rain, rain. So, so I apologize. I'll, I'll up, up the, the prayers, prayers next time. time. I will up, up the, the prayers. prayers. So, so I'm, I'm already, already working, working on them for next, next Saturday. We, we are having, having a Buildings and Grounds, grounds Work Day here on, on campus. campus. We, we have, have these, these a couple times through the year. Uh, it's, it's really nice to do this, this here. The beginning of spring, spruce up the campus a little bit because we'll have a lot of visitors here for Easter, Easter Sunday. Sunday. So, so it's a good, good time to do some weeding. weeding. Yeah! <laughs> now the, the thing, thing is about, about these work days, days is they're, they're also, also a lot of fun and, and they are a good way to come and meet other people in the community. You can get, you get some, some good, good conversation, conversation going when you're working, working on a project together. together. It, it is weeding, weeding so, so for those, those of you who are not mechanically or home improvement oriented, oriented like, like me, weeding, weeding is there. But there are other, other projects, projects as well. well. And, and there's, there's always food. food. 
you, you get, get here, here. There's, there's bagels, bagels. There's, there's coffee, coffee. You, you stop and you have lunch, lunch and then you have drink. drink. I mean, it, it just is, it's, it's a great day. It's a good, it's a good way, way to get involved. involved. It, it is, is a good way to get to know other people. There's more information in the glad tidings and you can also see what things are going on there as well. Also in the glad tidings this week, I'm gonna be starting a class after Easter that is an introduction to the Episcopal Church and, and to uh, the, uh, the Church, Church of, of the Nativity. Nativity. So, so if, if you, you are, are interested in that, that there is a registration link to that. that. And I'm, I'm going to encourage you to register so we, so can, we can figure, figure out, out the best, best time for us, us to meet. meet. So, so they're, they're holding, holding bubbles. bubbles. Look, Look at, at them. them. They're, they're so, so great. great. Um, um, so, so if you, you register, register so we can figure, figure out the best time to meet, meet. I, think I think we're going to need about uh, five, five, five weeks, weeks and uh, it'll, it'll be a way, way to learn more about the church and about the Episcopal, Episcopal church, church and especially for those who are interested in confirmation or being received in the Episcopal, Episcopal church. church. Um, um, there's, 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 uh, uh, that, that will be a way, way to do that. that. So, so to go to that sign up, you can use the QR code on the back of your bulletin. And, and that, that QR code, code will send you to this sign up. It will also send you to ways if you would like to give to Nativity electronically. You can do that. All kinds of great things there. Also, a reminder, Pride Packs next week. So the Backpack Buddies program, the first of the month, we always collect food to send over to Leesville Elementary. So when you're shopping this week, this is a great spiritual practice. I know we're not doing it for Lent. This is ongoing spiritual practice. Um, pick, up pick up some food, food to bring, bring for backpack, backpack buddies. buddies. There's, There's also, also information in the Glad Tidings about blessing bags. And this, and this is by Randy, Randy and Carol Smith, Smith something they started a couple years ago in honor of their son, son Justin. Justin. Packing bags to give to folks that you see on corners, corners who might not have a place to live at this time or might just need a blessing. So, so ways, ways to help get involved, involved with that. But also, also there will be bags available for you to take on Easter Sunday. It was, it was really, really hard, hard to believe, believe that, that next Sunday is Passion and Palm Sunday, Sunday and, and it, it does begin Holy Week. week. I know, I know, I know right? Yes, yes. So, so not, not only Backpack, backpack Buddy's collection, collection but, but we, we will, will gather, gather under the big tree with our palms. We will, we will welcome Jesus with hosannas, and then we will come back in here, and within the hour we're saying crucify him. him. It, it is a spiritual, spiritual whiplash that gets us ready for Holy Week. We'll continue, continue on Monday, Monday Thursday, and I invite you all, if you've never experienced a Monday Thursday service, please do come. It is one of the most special evenings of the church year. Monday, Thursday, and then Good Friday on that Friday, and then we will celebrate the joy of resurrection on Easter. So that's, that is here, which is hard to believe. And then finally, I have some very excellent news to share, you know that we have been short of a staff person. We have um, had a children and youth formation person in the past, and I am excited to announce that that position is now expanded. So it is an overall lay associate for Christian formation. So that includes all ages. It also really focuses on connecting the different program areas together. So if outreach is working on a particular program, so say when we do Stop Hunger Now, Rise Against Hunger, I keep calling it the wrong thing, that our education and formation programs can connect with that. If the Building the Grounds team is working on something, we can connect that. So it's really a way to bring our whole programmatic understanding to a more cohesive reason of why we do this. And so, so I'm very, very pleased, pleased to announce that we have hired that person, and, and on, on April the 2nd, 2nd Jeremy, Jeremy Klaus, Klaus will be our lay associate for Christian formation. And I thought I'd announce it here today as a special reward for you all for coming to church. It'll be in Glad Tidings next week, but today you get, you get special knowledge. <laughs> How gnostic of us, right? <laughs> All right. Wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. So uh, stick, stick around, around today if you have questions to ask the clergy, continuing our question series, um, um, if, if you, you want, want to. to. We'll, 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 we'll kind of greet and gather, and, and then anyone, anyone who has some, some questions, questions for us, stick around, and we'll answer any questions you might have. have. All right. Have, have a, a great, great week, week, everyone. Ascribe unto the Lord, the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts with thanksgiving.
our service, service continues, continues with the post with the if you could say prayer B, <laughs> that's on page 367 of the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and arch archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to your people, in, the, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died, he died for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacraments of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ. And bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God to the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Our service, service continues with the post-communion prayer found on page 365 of the Book of Common Prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Look with, with compassion, O Lord, upon this your people, that rightly observing this holy season, they may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks 